Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, the facts are these. Uh, <laughs> one year, five months, 16 days, uh, 18 October hours, and... 2007. So I'm, this is wrong, but pretend. Um, 18 years and 57 minutes ago, a uh, TV show called Pushing Daisies premiered on ABC? ABC. ABC, ABC. correct. I seldom pay attention to being a DVR person. And um, we are here to talk about it. Um, and why don't I let the panelists introduce themselves one by one. Okay, my name is Mimi Noyes. I am an artist. I traditionally live in Seattle, but I do live occasionally on the East Coast. Uh, and I am a reviewer of movies. I'm published in the Scarecrow Movie Guide. I wrote a Firefly uh, Guide. And uh, I work at Scarecrow Video, and I work at the Seattle International Film Festival. Um, and I am a big sucker for uh, magical realism, which even though it isn't specifically a magical realism film, it is certainly infused with magical realism attributes. Uh, hmm. So Pushing Daisy has totally caught my hmm. my heart. And she's got a still from the fall on her desktop, so you should all trust her. <laughs> my name is Sonia Tafe. Um, I don't have a name doohickey because I'm legally dead and I'm trying not to let my family find out. Uh, I'm, I'm a writer of short fiction and poetry. I left my name doohickey here last night and just mysteriously vanished. Um, I don't watch a lot of television. I, I watched things as a small child and they were in you know, a square one TV in the Muppet show, oh. so they did this to my brain. Um, I watched Babylon 5 when it was on the air and Pushing Daisies is one of two shows recently that I have followed at all. Um, so that very fact should speak to something either about the show or the wiring of my brain. <laughs> it will become clear as we praise this show more which one I want to believe it is. <laughs> um, Eric M. Van, I'm known in fandom as the program chair for Ritacon for 20 years, and uh, more recently become a massive um, a film geek, um, st but still not watching that. I don't think my TV watching changed a lot. The, the list of shows you keep there's in the refrigerator. A, okay, so there's like eight or ten shows that I watch at all, but that's a lot less than the average person. But um, but I, I'm just smitten with this show, and we'll talk also a bit about Brian Fuller's background, because it goes back to before that. Uh, I'm Michael E. Burstein. I'm a science fiction short story writer. I've uh, been nominated for Hugo's Nebula, as all my nominated stories are now collected in this book, which this is amateur hour to put this out, but <laughs> I'm very proud, so here it is. Uh, I, my wife and I watch a lot of television, especially genre television. I, I tend to think Pushing Daisies is, at the moment, I think one of the few shows that I really want to see when it's actually broadcast, um, which is a shame given what's <laughs> happening to the show. But uh, it, it, it is probably pushing the boundaries of television storytelling and storytelling in general more than anything else that I've seen in the past few years. I'm Nomi Burstein. I'm a uh, I'm a many things. I watch a lot of television. Actually, what we do is we don't watch a lot of television. We watch a lot of genre television. Um, probably 90% of what we watch on television is either science fiction or fantasy. And so it takes a lot for a show to stand out in my mind because we see so much genre. And Pushing Daisies completely, completely blew me away. Um, I'm an editor in my day job. I'm an editor and a writer in my day job. And so something that is fun and quirky with language also really gets me and Pushing Daisies just has this way of doing that and also I'm a knitter <laughs> and so any show that gives you a hero who is a knitter who saves the day because he always has knitting needles with him <laughs> anyone remember that episode yes. then you know knitters rule it's the worst part of the future um. If, if I can, like, leap onto the language comment for a second. Okay. Let, me, let me just yeah. say that the first round was going to be what makes you love the show. Language. And so Sony can start with language. It's, yeah. it's the only, pushing daisies is the only thing that I would, when people say, what would you describe it as? It's like Edward Gorey and the Marx Brothers dropped acid <laughs> about this show. Um, but I mean that about the Marx Brothers, because one of the things that they do with language is it's, they, they take a very highly colorful register of language already. And I mean, it, and it sort of starts on the film noir level. You know, her legs were so long, only the floor stopped them from going on forever, which is perfectly appropriate 
uh, considering that it, that it has at least ostensibly you know, a mystery plot solving framework. Um, and so it will take highly colored language and then it will run with it out on a limb and then it will quietly saw the limb off from underneath the viewer. So, so, you, so you have exchanges and I can't do these from memory, but you know, it, it, it just blurted out of me. You know, and, then, and then he says, you know, elaborating the associations of blurted like word vomit, and, to which Emerson says, yeah, and then you slipped it and fell on your ass and now you're covered in word vomit. Yeah. You know, which, which, which does remind me of the Marx Brothers because you're ha imagine you're having a conversation about contracts and finally Chico winds up saying, ah, oh, there ain't no sanity clause. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I can actually see how you got from point A to point B, but my brain so tried triumphant when he yes. says it. Mm. Yes, and there's, there's, there's the same sense of language as something that can be hot potatoed back and forth, can be elaborated on, can be rung changes on. It's like Calvin Ball approach to semiotics. The other thing I love about how, the lang how they use language is the names, many of the names are puns, and oh, then yeah. they mm -hmm. will show up. You know, someone will have a name that could also be, it's, it's very, it's a very proper name. You know, it's, it's not a, a contrived name, but it could also be a noun, and then that's the motif on their wallpaper. And then, mm -hmm. or for instance, the episode where they all had the raincoats. And Emerson right. Cod's yep. raincoat has, yes, cods has little on cod it. all okay. over it. Yes. And Olive has olives. And, and, yes. olives, and, yeah. olives. and yeah. just that realization that language is so much more than just what we say, it's also how we say it and what it means and the connotations and the denotations and just that whole, mm -hmm. that whole thing, it just makes it, I mean, the, the, it it's a lovely thing and, and you don't see enough of that on mainstream television. You really don't yeah. see enough of it and, right. you, and in many ways you do have to go back to the 30s and the 40s to get that kind of crackling mm -hmm. snap and, and banter yeah. to the language yep. and yeah. it's wonderful that someone's doing that on television and I'm Sure, it turned off many people like, dude, this is harder to follow than Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, to get on that thing, I mean, mm -hmm. the other aspect I like about it is that it harkens back to the tradition of storytelling because mm -hmm. we have a narrator, which most yes. of the time yes. is the most god awful, horrible thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. And without that, this show probably wouldn't hold together even half as well as mm -hmm. it does. You know, I mean, I love, you know, and again, I also like, uh, similarly to what I liked about the Firefly, was the archaic bits of language where she says, I'm going to be so mad, I'm going to start tearing the drapes. And he goes, It's true. Or he's like, No, I, did, I didn't. And please don't attack the window treatments. Yes. You know, <laughs> yes. Who says window treatments? Yes. Um, so, you know, the choice of the archaic bits of language and, and, and the and phraseology. And slipping in and out of literal and metaphorical. And right, exactly. You know, I mean, I always love it when the olive going, she's like, I used to think masturbation meant chewing your food. Yeah. And they just stare at her. She goes, I don't think that anymore. <laughs> um, so, you know, I agree with that. And I very much also agree. I, I've always been a big storyteller. So I love the storytelling aspect of it and the playfulness of it and the back and forth banter. And, and, the, and the interaction between the narrator and the dialogue. I mean, one, right. one of the narrator's best moments is in a very recent episode right. where, where something, something horrific happens and, and the very proper British tones of the narrator go, oh, hell no. And you couldn't do that if they hadn't built up the right, narrator like, as a character with his own voice right, and his own and Emerson too. and his well, own yeah. rhythms yeah. and Emerson. So the when the you're entire cross, series though, to that brilliant. point built to that joke. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, it wouldn't have worked done that's, the first that's season. wonderful. I mean, you, yeah. the, there's there's no implication that the. Na I wondered, and and it doesn't seem to be substantiated, if the narrator was going to be somehow built into the story as it progressed, and he doesn't seem to be. But that doesn't stop him from being at this point any less three dimensional than anyone we actually see here interact with and want to hit over the yeah. head occasionally. Yeah, it has that Princess Bride quality in that yeah. sense, where he's talking and then suddenly he's like, "Is this a kissing story?" Or you know, yeah. Yeah. he's interrupted yeah. and he's yeah. like, "Oh no, wait, look at this, put this back." Uh, <laughs> Perhaps better is Rock, the Rocky and Bullwinkle narrator. Yeah, Edward much. Everett Horton. Yeah, yeah. Just, he, but my, my brain is miswired because of him. I'm so <laughs> yeah. the, the the language part is obviously a, a great. I mean, with the writing and the storytelling, but. I mean, when you ask the question, what do you like about the show? And you know, honestly, I try to figure that out sometimes. I'm not quite sure why I like the show so much, because that I do. But I think that one of the things I like from the storytelling perspective is that the show always manages to surprise me. Um, I, I, you know, there, there are endings that I just don't expect to happen, and I don't expect these things to happen as quickly as they do. I, I mean, originally I was expecting the show of, okay, we're trying to, um, you know, we, we can't let... Um, Oh wait! Now, now I've just lost it. It's like, but, but like, there are secrets that have to be kept, mm -hmm. and then suddenly the secrets right. come out immediately. The story arcs, and you're like, I thought the story arc was going to be that he's going to keep these secrets for a year, year. and like, now <laughs> something else. Yeah. Hey, how the many fact, episodes did it take from Iron Who 
um, who Charlotte's mother is to, to, every, to, to basically everyone, everybody knows. And, and, it was like and, three and shows. For, and for me, shows. right now, I, I presume yeah. I'm presuming everybody has seen the show up to the final episode that was broadcast because I'm mm-hmm. about to reveal a big spoiler from mm-hmm. there. You know, so if you haven't oh, seen it, if it's back on your DVR, why didn't you watch yeah, it? You should have seen it by now. I did see it. I'm kidding. Okay. But but I, I I will tell you like the end, the, the revelation, the end of that final episode when we're suddenly told, there's his father, and it's like. I, you know, that was completely unexpected. I was yeah, like, right. "What? I, I want to know what's going to happen next." Yeah. Every episode, yeah. I want to know what's yeah, going to happen. Yeah, it wasn't. We, it wasn't for us necessarily because we've been. I don't know how much you guys talk about it. We have a group of about five people who've been well, watching we, it every week, we, and we kick we had, every we had, episode we had around. Seen. We'd seen Ned's father in, in the pie hole at least once, yes. like many, many, yes. many episodes. Right. Right. So we knew he was, so we knew he was around, and you knew that he wasn't the person who'd hoisted them up off the branch because the voice is wrong for Chuck's father. Right, and, and, yeah. and I, compl- I missed that. Uh-huh. I, I missed yeah. them completely yeah. in there until that the yeah. revelation. But the other yeah. thing that I've always loved about this show, and more and more shows do this now, but it's still, but it, but it, it has it's the kind of detailed buildup that we can argue about. Like, <laughs> yeah. did you see yeah. that? Did you not? Yeah. As opposed to, oh, well, that came out of nowhere. Yeah. But yeah. that's another thing is that you know, and that's what I was going to say is that one of the things that I love about this show that other shows are starting to do that and some of them have done like and of all shows that do it Simpsons does it mm. um, a random thing at a beginning of an episode that seems like a toss away you know mm. it's only 42 minutes later when you get to the end that that little toss away becomes so importantly vital to wrapping up everything else and all of these little plot threads that you really didn't think were all connected, they all become really, really vital. And I love that because there's such richness in that sort of storytelling. And it gets you really watching close because you say, wait a minute, was that important or was that stupid? Was that, you know, and, and particularly because the show is so highly colored in pretty much every aspect, it, it does, it... It, it either has to train you to watch for everything or you just have to sit there and sort of go, wow. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to add also, because yeah. I didn't get to before, uh, yeah. with the, no, no, you're like, right. Hit me if I'm going. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's not just word candy, it's eye candy. I'm an oh, artist, God. and it's, that's part of what I love about it is the fact sensuous. that they don't bother having the great fancy special effects. I mean, you've got this pigeon with this wing, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know, yes, yes, yes. clearly very fake, or, you know, you've got, you know, the, the really crappy little car, or you have, you know, I mean, especially even when they have all the flashbacks, and it's clearly this incredibly fake tree with AstroTurf mm-hmm. and this kid yeah. standing there and somebody running off the set behind yeah. him. Um, and I yes. love the fact that they use these colors yeah. and these, thea- I mean, the theatricalness actually feeds yes. into that whole, this is a memory, not a reality, you yeah. know, this is not yeah. what's happening and, and, now. And the theatricality is, is beautifully done because the show does consistently something that I'd previously only associated with Junet and Caro. If you've seen Delicatessen mm-hmm. or City of Lost well, Children. Junet is a huge yeah, influence. So yeah, he said as much. Yeah. Emily the, the, is a huge the, the, influence. That ki- the kind of time slippage that occurs in, in, the, in the setting and you know, the, the cars look like they might be from the 30s or 40s or the 50s. Or then you, you see Finns is like, okay, the 60s, I give up. That's clearly some kind of bastard Thunderbird. You know, but, the, but, the, but the dialogue is modern, but there are private eyes, but there's neon, but there's internet, but you can run off to a nunnery and have a kid. And it's marvelous. Yeah, it's I mean, very, the, yeah, the show's a fable. It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not, it's not just that, it's right. theatrical. It. Yeah. There's, there's, two, there's yeah. world building yeah. going on that you don't notice. Yeah. It's a forensic there's fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah. There's two things I want that come to mind that are just come out that have come out of this conversation. One is that it's ballsy to insert a fantastic premise into a magic realist world, into a world where everything is heightened, everything is not is fundamentally it. unrealistic, and yet to keep it differentiated. I mean, to create that world and then to still have Ned's power be extraordinary. Right. That's, I mean, that's part of the genius of the show. I mean, the, I think the tropism that most film showrunners would have been given the, I had this great idea about a character who can do this. Well, I have to set that in as realistic a world, you know, as possible in order to make his power, you know, to pop out at you. Yeah, but that's such a great exact power. You, opposite. you can stop with crazy right. and just go, whoa. The exact yeah. opposite <laughs> yeah. has been done here. And the I other also, thing that, that I thought of the... Like uh, David Lundin. Um, is the way, in terms of the, the, the way show is structured. I love the way that the apparently inconsequential gimmick of a single episode has come back to be important to the show. And I'm specifically thinking of the pop-up book. 
Yes. We had a whole yes. we had a whole episode involving pop-up books. Now suddenly Emerson has got it's his new thing, and he's written a pop-up book to find his his, his daughter. daughter. And so like, and to someone who would like maybe missed that one episode, you'd you would have accepted it. But if, having seen that episode, it's it's and in then, the show for a and reason. And it doesn't stop as a pop-up book because then you get Emerson's mother, and you get the yeah, whole multi-generational right, yeah. thing <laughs> yeah. being yeah. going on again. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, with with no explanation of how she could be his mother. It's, and, 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 and no no explanation from the narrator, no questions from the, from, from the other. Which is a very magical realism Aaron. thing. Yeah. It's kind of like, here's the universe, suck it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> but, then, but then you've also got, you know, if you look at who they cast in this show. Mm -hmm. Oh God, they're great. You've got, you've got Ellen Green, mm -hmm. and you have Kristen Chenoweth, and, and, every, and yeah. every once in a while they find a reason for one or the other or both of them to burn out your soul. And who yeah. they're singing Birdhouse in Your Soul, soul. Yeah. and just, the song from I, Greece. I, I, yes, you know I I have loved Ellen Green since uh, mm. Little Shop of Horrors. Yep, I've loved Kristen Chenoweth forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. And Put the two of them together and throw in Swoopsie Kurtz. It doesn't matter who the rest of the and cast is. And don't and waste, that's the and, 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 and thing, don't waste them. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you, you yeah. have them in the show, and, and you can get away with it. Have them sing a song. Yeah. Have, the, have this wonderful direction. Yeah. You know, have Alan Green had them recently, the great song. She had a song within the last half of the yeah. episode. Yeah, yeah, she yeah. did. I, and then, and then I don't course, remember which one it was. Kristen Chenoweth in the nunnery doing the parody of Sound of Music. Of, <laughs> of sound of music. Good. Yeah. And yeah. then there's a whole bunch of stuff that gets thrown into the Lighthouse episode just because they have Jim Dale doing the narration. And someone yeah. in their audience are kids who were like hopelessly scarred by Pete's dragon at a young and impressionable <laughs> age. So you, can, so you can throw in all of the, like, the New England Lighthouse stuff. Yeah. And, and what was the song? That there was Candle on the Water, yeah, yeah. which gets reorganized as a finger-snapping barbershop quartet. And they're like, I, 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 I do have to throw out one criticism and all that. And I remember the episode where they go to the nunnery, and he introdu and, and Emerson kind of introduces themselves. I'm Father Dowling, this is Father Mulcahy, and Sister yeah. Christian. And of course, <laughs> we're getting that. That's a joke. But, 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 but I didn't really believe it when the, the head of the nunnery, actual, or whoever it was who yeah. came to investigate, said we you know, uh, you know, knew that that was the reference to MASH in a TV show and a right. song. You know, and, and it's like, because I'm thinking that they're just having fun with the audience. Right. But, but also, so that's, 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 yeah. that's the show messing with your mind because yeah. you don't know what in this reality what right. what exists, what, what exists also, from ours. Yeah. You know, Sister Christian, you can tell they know who their audience is because Sister Christian was a song that was popular in 1986. Right. <laughs> Unless you were actively involved in music in the, around 1985-86. You might not have ever heard of this song and it wouldn't resonate with you and they don't seem to care. You might not even know who Father Darling or Father Mulcahy were. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, uh, perhaps we just mentioned that episode. I think my maybe my single favorite scene in the, in the show so far is the scene where, where um, Ned is trying to figure out from the photo uh, that, that Olive is showing him you know, the, the secret. Right, what, you know, right. what, what, what is in this photograph? Oh, yeah, and, and she can't yeah. tell him, but if he gets... Even, yeah. even, after she, even after he's gotten that, 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 that that's um, um, Lily pregnant, it's like, Chuck has a sister? Yeah. <laughs> Chuck, like, Chuck has a sibling? It's like, and it's like, no, put it together. And again, this, the whole, especially because the whole sequence was unexpected, because like you said, uh -huh. I was expecting it to be six more episodes. Yeah, yeah I totally expected her to hold on to that secret, and yeah. then it's like, and, she's, <laughs> and her blurting it, the, the, her blurting it to get it off her chest so that someone else would have the secret is so in character and so incredibly well played by Kristen Chenoweth, who, mm -hmm. if she does not get a supporting actress mm -hmm. nomination for the Emmys, there's no... But, but then they also, you know, they also do things like um, the whole setup with the ring and where um, the it is the ring, right? The the watch. The watch. Sorry, the watch. The watch. The watch. About the three has, watches. You know, who has the watch? Where is the watch? Who thinks the watch is important for mm -hmm. which reason? Right. Well, we're yeah. now we're and getting into the game. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, everyone yeah. thinks it's important for a different reason. Uh -huh. You know, and we and we which, which, don't which still possibly know. disqualifies what? it from being a MacGuffin. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It, it it sort of transcends the MacGuffinness mm -hmm. of yeah. it. I just uh, while we're while, while we're still tangentially in the yeah. same neighborhood yeah. as, as the nunnery. <laughs> um, 
and if this were pushing daisies, I could make some kind of comment about maps. <laughs> um, the, the magic realism suck it up and deals like, okay, um, <laughs> so so we, we know Chuck is Jewish because the, we saw the funeral for her well, father, so what is her mother doing going to a nunnery anyway? Never mind, there's a nunnery, we're gonna run with it. <laughs> Possibly it's just a nunnery, so they have the excuse of saying Father Dowling, Father Mulcahy, yeah. and Sister Christian. Or they're like, God in heaven, I really, really, really want to do a sound of move exp- a move right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 I want that scene yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. there, there, there isn't really a place for someone Jewish to go. <laughs> Have a baby. Yeah. Go to a nunnery. Don't tell them. Yeah. Yeah. They'll never figure it out. Better place to disappear as right. a Jewish person. In a nunnery. We would look for you there. Yeah. Nobody. And also with, I, Christi- I love that. with Kristen Chenoweth's religious background, she is a, she is very observant. Oh, I didn't know that. I don't know if yeah. She's a devout Chenoweth. evangelical. She's a, she's a yeah. devout evangelical. Oh. Oh. So giving her, but she has said in interviews that, um, she. She's not one of the evangelicals who doesn't have a sense of humor about it, and so she's willing to, you know, poke at her own religion. Mm-hmm. And you sort of see that in, also in the nunnery scene. That, mm-hmm. you know, everything about the nunnery is just that much askew. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. no That's real nuns could ever come out of that <laughs> nunnery. <laughs> yeah. Was I the only one that caught the name of the actual priest? Was it sounded pretty fake? I can't remember what it was off the top of my uh, head, but you remember the priest's name? I don't you, remember. Wait, what are we? Which priest's name? In the which, nunnery. The, nunnery. Not, the, the one nunnery. actually they the one who visited p- from the Vatican, or? <laughs> and his name was just, it, a list of just as fake, except oh. not quite okay. the same. Well, this way. is just the main character. Oh, list of characters. Yeah, yeah you'd have to like go to the episode people. guide and look at look at mm-hmm. other books. characters. Anyway, we'll look that up. I'm looking while you do it. While off, I don't know where this fits at all, but just some sort of off-screen motivations. Um. Apparently, someone asked um, Brian Fuller at some point, you know, what, what's what's the deal with what's the deal with the coroner? Why does he never, you know, blink when people hand him money? And the answer is the coroner's got a crush on Emerson, <laughs> <laughs> which would presumably which be a future plot line, which we'll probably now never get to see. Right. Like, we'll probably- which yeah. would probably make Emerson run for the hills. Oh, God. Oh, God. And, oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bitch, I was in proximity. proximity. <laughs> you know, and, just, and if you triangulate that with your, with a dog trainer, you know, Simone, I mean, there sort of been, you know, one, there could have been, like, multiple freewheeling, you know, romantic, what on earth is that? It's, it's no plot. Okay, they're, yeah. like, jackhammering. Yeah. Anyway, but, but, you know, but that, but that also makes perfect sense, because, you know, the, the coroner, just sits there, nods, takes the money. They can't possibly be paying him enough not to wonder how you wind up with a guy who was on the table a minute ago with a bar through his head, unconscious in the doorway with a bar through his head. You know, but, but the answer is, okay, Emerson's hot, so I'll just, you know, shut up, nod, and hope someday he'll say, nice sweater. <laughs> or knit him a sweater. Right. Or knit there, there you go. Yeah. Well, we already had the, the so Emerson's sweet. rant about the Christmas sweater. Yeah. Who yeah. gives a Christmas sweater? You want right. to get your... You know, right. Yeah. Um, I wanna. Um, I have a note of some ground we should cover. Um, Pioneer anomaly, flyby anomaly. That's my other talk. Um, <laughs> Relativity and quantum mechanics. No, no, are that's not what the show is about. A pencil talk. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about influences, and I actually, how many people agree with me? I think there's a shot in the pilot, which is it absolute shot from Big Fish by Tim Burton. Oh, it's I mean, hugely big. Yeah, I mean, when yeah. I try to explain it to people, I say, the first thing I always ask them is, have you seen Big, big Fish? fish. Uh-huh. Because that is the closest you're going to get, because it has the, yes. the visual colorization, yeah. it has the mm-hmm. theatrical yeah. set stage and the quality, story. you have the narrator yeah. quality with the actual visual the re- the, the connections, retelling that the retelling, punches everything up just yeah. a little. Exactly. Yeah. That's the best way to, for yeah. me to describe it to people. Uh, so he, so he, so I, I do believe he tipped that off by framing one of the shots, it's, it's uh-huh. exactly a, uh, one of them, the shots remember from Big Fish. And then also he's talked about Junot, the French director, mm-hmm. who, um, whose best film, to my mind, is Amelie, though so others people prefer either Delicatessen or City of Lost mm-hmm. Children. And of course he already had a real strong interest in this, you know, fancifulness, because mm. he was a major, um, you know, he was the executive producer for Wonder Falls, which yes. is actually, well, I wanted to talk this, about, yeah. this was made, this role was made for Lee Pace, you know, yeah. he, yes. he specifically pulled him in. Yeah, and I didn't even realize, but did you realize that the, the Muffin Lady? Yeah, it was yes. from, yes. 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 from yes. Wonder Falls. Yes. Yes. Let's talk about, how many people are not familiar, I don't think anyone, have you, are you a dead like me? Have dead, you seen yeah. dead like me? Mm-hmm. Okay, you maybe can speak about us. Are we all Wonder Falls? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah all Wonder Falls, okay. We all, well, 
I um, thought Wonderful. We should, we should explain. Yeah. Dead Like Me and Wonder Falls were the two shows that Brian Fuller did before he did Pushing Daisies. Dead Like Me was on HBO, I believe, for yeah. two seasons. It two was seasons. about a young girl who dies and discovers <coughs> that she seasons. now two seasons. Yeah. No. She, she now has one of her job. She now she can't go to heaven or wherever. She's stuck on Earth with other people whose job it is to escort other people who die mm -hmm. to the afterlife. And then Wonder Falls was another quirky little show about again a young a young woman who works at a um, a tourist uh, store Shop in, in, in Niagara Falls, Falls who, and, and the animal creatures and these animal figurines start the talking chuckings, to her yeah. and giving her instructions. But very but very do. Extremely cryptic tourist instructions. <laughs> like, you know, like, like, like uh, moo, have a pancake. <laughs> <laughs> or or um, what was the one with the... the, the um, Bring her home. Was a bring, bring that's her the, that's the that's bring the crown home, creamer. Yeah. She first she tells her have a pancake, which yeah. stalls her enough that their cook, who is an illegal immigrant yeah. from Canada, gets busted. And then she goes, "Moo, take her home." Yeah, it's like cool. <laughs> and and, yeah. and, and, Ooh, and these cool. episodes, it's like she has no idea why she's doing these things. She's following instructions of animals, and she, she wants these figurines to shut up. But at the end of every episode, everything they told her to do falls into place mm. perfectly. Eventually, it's <laughs> and I, I, I played, her, played her brother. Yeah, Lee, Lee, Lee played, played, played her brother. brother. The, 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 was the guy. Who the, is pie maker. the pie maker. Yeah. I, I will say that Wonder Falls is, is basically as good as Pushing Daisies. Wonder Falls is one of my all-time five favorite TV shows. So we're, great. we're up there with Buffy, and mm -hmm. so is Pushing Daisies, Dexter. Yeah. Okay, um, I really hate to spoil a love fest. I did not like Wonder Falls. Um, it's, it, 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 it appeared to me to be a very bold attempt to recreate Joan of Arcadia without God. Except that it came before. No, no, it didn't no, come it before. I'll try it out. No. About the same time. No. About, uh, yeah. about the same um, time. But. Yeah, as it so happens, both uh, Dead Like Me, well, I won't go into that. Yeah, but um, yeah, no, as a matter of fact, um, Wonder Falls, he has talked about that it's, Joan, that they, it's a Joan of Arc character. Mm -hmm. But I believe it was, that was, idea was completely developed. It was not in any way, shape, or form a ripoff. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just. Uh, Joan of Arcadia did come first. And uh, actually, but not and, by and who was, uh, 2003 versus 2004. They were. I didn't really find them that much the same, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it, well, they're so close together, it can't. TV, TV them, shows take forever to get onto the air. The, and uh, he's, 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 with Joan of Arcadia, he says right up front, "I'm God," and she's like, "I don't want to deal." With uh, Wonder Falls, she doesn't really know who these are, what Which, they are, why they are. Well, they I, certainly talk I'm, to her a great deal less. And she as never a, really as a it. viewer, because yeah, I am aware yeah, she finds yeah. that yeah. the, in, the, in the, the right. industry was very unhappy with Joan of Arcadia yeah. mm. uh, because um, uh, they didn't like having God as a character. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And it, it, as a viewer, it just God? appeared to me that that's the reason. Oh, no, no, no. I don't really, no. I mean, if you look at any industry, you'll always notice that one studio comes out with something and somebody else comes no. out, you had The Illusionist, and then you had The yeah. Prestige yeah. six months later. Clearly, they had to be being made at the same time. It's it's exactly. You know, you had The Bug's Life, and then you had yeah. um, The Ants. Yeah. Which is one of the things that makes Pushing Daisies yeah. so incredible, because it, it, it is, when they were talking about critics were first watching it, how incredibly original it was compared to anything mm -hmm. else on mm -hmm. television. Yeah. You know, even other genre yeah. stuff or genre yeah. adjacent. It really shows. stepped out. And yeah. probably, and, and, I mean, a lot of it had probably to do with the big fish, you know, and the success of that, because that was at least an establishing factor of this works. Yeah. But, also, okay. but also the fusion, the fact that the plots are all more often than not built around, you know, here's a murder mystery, we'll solve that, but it's not actually your standard police procedural. No. It's not even your it's not even your standard you, police procedural if you could interview the dead, because there could have been a way to make this, you know, a very realist show where it's all about solving mysteries and the fact that he can interview the dead only gives him slightly more of an edge. But that's, that's like that's not that's, that's, that's yeah. the springboard for the first yeah. the television medium right. true, is true for yeah, yeah. True yeah. Well, I, I don't watch TV. The was, you know, she basically it's a cop show, right. but she can communicate with. She's yeah. a medium. Right. Fine. Yeah. And, so and, and you it, can pull, right. but you can pull like eight different genres together and 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 not even melt yeah. them, but in, sort of knot them together. Yeah. In this show, it, the first tip off that the things. police procedural aspect might not be normal. The very first crime this new team go that we see the team go crack is the. Involves a car that runs on dandelions. Yes, you know it's like yes. completely and, and crash test dummies involved. It's yeah. a, and it's you know completely left field and. 
and, 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 I, and I mean it about Edward Gorey. You know, yeah. the, 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 the very matter-of-fact macabre that you get when they're interviewing people, and it, it's a serious progressive, like, okay, special effects guys, what kind of death haven't we done? We never did someone who melted. Okay, get on it. Right, and And the ways that this interferes with talking to them or interviewing them. Right. You know, and, but, and that's, and that's like, why can't I see? Well, that's because your eyes are flat. Right. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and that's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Deep fried girl. You could, you, could, you could do a Gashley yeah. Crumb Tinies for, you know, the murders of Pushing Daisies. Yeah. Yeah. Eaten by bears. That would be great. No, no, no we're here. Yeah, okay. you. Yep. Uh, what, I was, what I'm thinking is that even though you have all these grisly murders that are on CSI or <laughs> CSI Miami, you have all these special effects shots of going inside and blood, and it's still you got this massive sense of innocence on the mm -hmm. show. Yeah. You know, into the fact that they're there's a they're in love, but they're never gonna have sex, and they're never gonna come close to having sex. Well, um, they could do a lot of things with plastic. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> I assume, That's a different panel. I assume that already they're doing. They uh, got the plastic. Uh, 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 I, I, I don't want that image. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're spoiling the innocence. Oh, you're, you're spo yeah, it's a very there's, innocent there's, show. There yeah. is an Emerson line like that. There's a, where, where, where Ned just says something about contraptions, and there's an instant ah reaction. <laughs> <laughs> but I and there think, was already one mention of the came in and walked in on you and didn't want to know about or yeah. do you remember that yeah. incident I, uh -huh. not not to quote but yeah. yes I mean so that so that that's another thing that it that it is a show with a with a very high innocence level and it's also a show with a very high innuendo level I mean if, if yeah. you if you're going to play as much with language as as this show does they're clearly going to exploit every facet of it can, can I just, yeah. say, oh, oh, well, yeah. just just to bring this up but yeah. I have mentioned this to Nomi I, I will okay. say that either Fuller or his ca or cinematographer or somebody, they do seem to be somewhat obsessed with cleavage. Well, if you had Kristen Chenoweth with the cast, <laughs> what would you, yeah. what would you <laughs> but I mean, no, but there's, there's a, Green. I have to, there, there, there's, there's, there's more of it, I, I do say there's more of it in that show than I've seen in other genre shows. Okay. So Although it's it getting worse now on other genre shows, well, too. Yeah. And you're saying that it's a bad thing. Yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. okay, so, the, I, but I think everywhere. that, you know, you mentioned Emerson and mm -hmm. the thing, you know, what he doesn't want to know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think in many ways Emerson plays a very important role on this magical realism, you know, throw all the genres mm. together in a pot, and Emerson's going, I'm the only sane one here. <laughs> I'm the only one anchored in the real world. And he makes and a pop-up book to find his lost <laughs> daughter. <laughs> that is still, yeah, well. he is still the most anchored character, even yes. with the pop-up book. Yeah. I'm not actually sure he is, and that's one of the things that I like about him, that, 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 he, that he views himself as, okay, I, I am you know, the hardened private investigator, I'm the cynical one around here, I'm the only person who's grounded, and I'm going to have a torrid love affair with a, do with, with a dog trainer or, you know, who keeps clicking things, you know, and it, like, it, so I can't get a word in edgewise. Thank you. And that's incredibly hot. You know, I'm, I'm going to sit here and stress knit. I'm going to make up. I'm, I'm going to make a pop-up book to find my daughter. I was raised by my mother as a private investigator, and some of my best memories of a child are hanging upside down, taking pictures through someone's window. He's actually. He's, he's nowhere near as yeah. normal as he thinks he is, and that's some of what makes him so wonderful. Yes. I mean, but at the same time, compared to everybody else, you know, he yeah. can't bring anyone back from the dead. Yeah. He hasn't been brought back from the <laughs> yeah. dead. He's yeah. not. I, he didn't. He's not a former synchronized swimming so star with yeah. the Kamo the Yeah, yeah. And, and he's not. He's not a world famous jockey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the yeah. kind of. Uh, I don't know. I, I, yeah. I act. I actually think that. That Ned is the character with with the most normal set of emotional responses yeah. oh, yeah, of anyone yeah. on the show. I was about to say that. And that's lovely. That. Yeah. Yeah. Ned had Ned the most the normal everywhere. childhood. Yeah. Well, 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 and to make your lens character the guy who can zots people back from the dead yeah. is just. Yeah. Well, we think about how isolated Ned was. You know. Yeah. I was. I I have argued that in in essence, Emerson Codd is the anti magical Negro. <laughs> that he is, Ooh, he is yeah. I mean, that we have the, the cliche of the magic negro yeah, right. who comes in and solves problems and you know just through their neck they're they're sort of a catalyst as opposed to a character yeah. well a yes he is he is unmagical mm -hmm. um i mean and and that's a good thing that 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 puts mm -hmm. him that that makes him the grounding force which isn't mm -hmm. usually what the what the magical negro is is like i said the catalyst right. comes yep. in you know, makes it all magical. And not, yeah. but not, and not actually a person. Whereas yes. Emerson has got so many weirdnesses, he's three-dimensional yes. by soul. Yeah. And, yeah. and they have gone, then it, but he is not just the dark, you know, the dark voice, the, mm -hmm. the dark voice of 
sensibility. He actually is just as quirky. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. well, he's just they, as quirky. They step beyond <clears throat> the, even the anti-magical Negro. Yes. Yeah. He's like to, the anti-Green Mile. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, he's, he's the much needed yeah. balance. I mean, yeah. you have these three characters, all of whom are could potentially be saccharine sweet, and you've got the three saccharine sweet characters, and then you've got you've got your two crusty sardonic characters, yeah. which is Cod and Swoozy Kurtz. And, yeah, yeah, uh, Lily. Yeah, Lily. Yeah, you know, Olive is actually. Need that. I'm wondering whether Olive is, in some ways, the most <coughs> normal. I mean, except for her, you know. But of course, who wouldn't have a crush on Ned? I mean, especially been working there, <laughs> working all that yeah. time. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and living but, in that building. All that time. Yeah. <laughs> no, she's not a stalker. With all the Paisley and Toll painting. Yeah. I, I very much loved the, 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 the recent turn of the arc where it looked like the show had moved on from her crush permanently to a, okay, we've learned to live with it. Right. But that's not the way real life works. <laughs> and so they brought back her crush like, again in, in a very here. realistic <laughs> way, really. And, and pre nice. presumably in right. something that's going to play out over the next the three episodes we haven't seen. And, and would have well, played out over many more episodes. Yeah, if we yeah had it would be nice to have played out over yeah. kneecaps. Yeah. yeah, many more episodes. Mm. I, I wanted to bring up something um, that I appreciate and noticed about the show. I wasn't sure if anyone else noticed. Mm. The concept in television that women are presented as only people on television shows as a focus or sexual beings if they're under the age of 30 and that keeps getting dragged down further. Mm -hmm. But how much I like on this show how you have Vivian and Lily being presented as sexual women. Mm -hmm. They are walking around the cleavage and whatnot. <laughs> and you, moment, you would expect someone of their age to behave very matronly. Mm. And that's, that makes the world, in my opinion, pop a little bit more. Mm. Is, and it, well, yeah. the fact that Vivian ha is, is interested, what was Stephen Root's character's name? Uh, Dwight, Dwight, Dwight Dixon. Dwight Dixon. Yeah, Dwight yeah, Dixon. Yeah. The fact that, that she's interested in Dwight and that, yeah. she, and that she has that whole you know, that, 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 that desire for that relationship with yeah. him. I mean, as a real person as right. opposed to matronly. Because yeah. I see they do that a lot. You have Giles and Buffy. He's not seen as a sexual <coughs> being, and usually if they will do that, it's kind of like they kind of mock it, where the whole like you know, what's a stupidor? Stupidor. <laughs> yeah. Well, who is? Do stop. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Stop uh, thinking about it. Well, he did have his orgasm friend, <laughs> if you the, as, as Anya so memorably <laughs> described. Yes. <it. laughs> um, on the whole, the show does really interesting things with multiple generations, which yes. is, I mean, which, which is a huge theme footnoted right from the beginning. But I like the fact that it keeps playing out, so you get. Emerson's mother, you know, mm. you get different layers. You, you get you, the, the two, the con and the the uh, windmill woman who become the con man's yes. son, yes. or you know, yes. and yeah. the windmill daughter. Yeah. And 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 you and you get tons no. of, you know, childhood memories and who you think people are and who they turn out to be and and your mm. your description that. Chuck's father can't have been the squeaky clean white picket fence dad that she remembers, if for no other reason that he was gallivanting around in the desert with Dwight Dixon and, and Ned's, and Ned's father, dad, who's both of whom we know are kind of deadbeats on the moral front. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and the fact, good, even yeah. meeting meeting Ned's half brothers, mm -hmm. yeah. you know that that opened a whole other. Yeah. With his own yeah. bros. That was <laughs> one thing, I, I'm glad you remembered that because that whole conversation, mm -hmm. one of the, the things, the best things the show has done is shown Chuck's totally believable, totally warranted, unconditioned love for her dad while unflinchingly portraying the dad is, is someone who would have hung out with Dwight Dixon and mm -hmm. Ned's father and been some kind of a shady character. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's so true. Right. People, and people gives die young, you remember them hagiographically. Yeah. You know, yeah. or, or they disappear out of your lives and you meet them years later and you're like, oh. Or you yeah. were never, you were never betrayed in the first place. Correct. I mean, she was a little girl. She didn't know the truth. That's yeah. the image that she's going to keep forever. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, well, except now that he's dead and you know being kind of a schmuck. But, yeah. but she's in right. denial about it because yeah. she yeah. cannot believe it. Because she, she, right. she, she would shatter a uh, you yeah. know a yeah. treasured memory that she's um, been holding her together for years. And when you when you have that, I mean, that's one of the things that they do to portray her realistically. Yeah. When you have that loss of a parent, mm -hmm. yeah, um, it doesn't matter. Even if you remember their flaws as you're mm -hmm. getting older. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact is that, that it is so realistic that she would, you know, she knows what the risks are, she knows mm -hmm. what's going to happen, and she says to her dad, put on the glove, play dead, I'll come back, I'll get, although yeah. it's, it's kind of bizarre, like, would you trust your daughter to come and unbury you later, but you know, I will come back and get you, but it just, it makes so much sense that anyone would do that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, no matter you know, what they do or do not remember. And that ties in nicely, sorry, that ties in nicely with the fact that no matter what, Ned wants to keep Chuck alive. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's it's a nice parallel. And yeah. again, it, it mm-hmm. talks. It and it's why he lot. understands and forgives her because exactly. And he said that he said that explicitly to and her. It, that and I, it yeah. speaks very nicely to the writing because you know they do call out that parallelism. Mm. Then and, yeah. and that's you know not every yeah. show would make sure that we get that. Yeah. And and but it also the, but the show also trusts you not to be utterly stupid. Right. It's not like we <laughs> have don't to, have we to have say have, yeah. no neon signage is necessary. But that's I mean the. Yeah. The underpinnings of, of the show. I mean, we, we've been talking about the flash and dazzle of the language and the color palette, mm. but I mean, but it would it would have collapsed utterly, or it would have been an entertaining little meringue. <laughs> no insult to meringue is very tasty. <laughs> <laughs> if, you know, if if there were if there were not really solid character work structured yeah, under all of it. I mean, that we, we that we can sit here and have a fairly serious conversation about the emotional consequences of bringing your dad back from the dead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you I'll tell you how great the character work is. I'll find myself saying things the way Ned would say them. And the only other well, person the I do that. Sort of yeah. And no no, I mean in the tone of voice and the, with the, that same per- peculiar, you know, deadpan, detached sort of mm-hmm. withdrawn parenthetical, parenthetical mm-hmm. withdrawn sort of that fear he he says things. There's and always this the colonel. There's yeah. that hesitation, but he's but he says the most forthright things in, in the yeah, most hesitant yeah, manner. And the only other person who has that affected me is John Stewart. I'm always doing the John Stewart. You know? <laughs> I, got, I got nothing. Um, but uh, um, I wanted to um, to make sure we spend some time and it's it's, it's quarter off. So let's do this well, speculating wait, on. Oh, 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 that's the one quickly. last question. Yeah, for um, why we're still on, why we love the show. Uh, oh on Thursday, I saw a wire service article. Fuller is negotiating with ABC for some for either a, a final episode or a two hour movie to wrap things up. Oh, good. But what yeah, he basically that. says is don't hold your breath. Yeah. This it might be a while, was what uh, I heard. Or or it, might or, not or, or it could yeah. collapse. Yeah. Well the other thing also that um, was stated was the original thing was there was gonna be the last three episodes and the last the third episode was going to end on a cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. And he has been using the time in post production to change that ending mm-hmm. so it is not a cliffhanger. Uh-huh. Yeah, that I had also heard. Yeah. And, yeah. and so that, that that is has been stated yeah. and uh, And that he did as a service to the as a service to the viewers because he had heard a lot of bad feedback about you can't leave it on a you know, mm-hmm. the fact that they had announced, and I know I read it in, the, in an Entertainment Weekly episode, mm-hmm. in, in an Entertainment mm-hmm. Weekly issue, uh, that right. there was going to be this major cliffhanger, and there was a lot of negative reader feedback right. about that. Even, even with the announcement that they were going to do a comic, comic book, book. book and then a movie. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is this the part of the panel where we can, like, rant at ABC? Well, no, no, no. <laughs> let, let me, let me um, uh, for those of you who don't know the whole history, right. the, and there's some that, uh, information that I glean myself that you might not know. Um, the show was a hit when it started. It was one of the very first shows to be picked up for a full season. And it finished the year as the highest rated new show that was, if you exclude reality shows and spin offs. AFI picked it as one of their top 10 television mm-hmm. shows of the year. I mean, the critics loved it, but the fact is that people watched it. The only new show that people watched more was the Grey's Anatomy spin off or a couple of reality, reality shows, new reality shows. I, I used to and it got nominated yeah. for 12 Emmys. Got nominated for 10 to one best um, screen. For outstanding lead actor, uh, outstanding supporting actress, outstanding writing for a comedy series. It won three yeah. for best direction of comedy, best outstanding score, and outstanding editing. Okay, well, the directing for it. The pilot won either. I knew it won either directing or, or writing, but it won, yeah. won the directing. Um, so. Um, so it was a, a, it's always been a massive critical hit, but it was a popular hit. It was a, it's rarely been a show so original to do so well. And then, of course, as you know, writers strike. Only nine of the 22 contracted episodes were ever done. Every single show that was not brought back by the, the three networks after the writers strike tanked the next year mm-hmm. in the ra- ratings, no yeah, matter how well it was done. So the whole thing of uh, you, this is one of those instances. Um, and the mu- if anyone here is a big star fan musically. You know, this is the, 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 the uh, I'll explain that later in the hallway. Um, 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 the, this show did not tank because it was too good for people. It tanked because of the strike and then... It, it and the fact that they chose to delay they it. They chose to delay it. And it, did, it didn't seem like a bad idea. I mean, their, their logic at the time was, we don't want to push and rush and make right. some half-assed episodes. We'd rather wait and do it right. But the problem is, is that... This is a 15-minute attention span right. deficit. They needed to re- they needed to run ads and replay the whole first season. Yeah, they should have told the yeah. 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 what happened was yeah. 
Unfortunately, <coughs> during the strike, people found other things to do other than watch television. Yeah. And just because their show came back, you know, those of us who were rabid about the show... The rabid ones came back, but all the casuals... But everyone else were like, yeah, well, it was okay, but now we have... And it was totally it's totally a function of the reminder factor. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't happen to the did, shows that nearly yeah. came back. A lot of people thought it had been canceled, in fact. A lot of okay. people were like, oh, that didn't that was canceled, you know, because yeah. it didn't come back. So they were right. like, oh, it must have been canceled. Have been and I'm canceled. like, no, yeah. it's coming back next season. Yeah. They're like, oh, but a lot of people didn't get that, you know, memo. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, a shame, a shame, a shame. Um, Running it as a summer series. I still it think that the, the metric is re, okay, re, they've got now so they've got now one season's worth of episodes between the two nine and thirteen yeah. Yeah. run the entire thing and advertise it and you'll know you'll sell the DVDs well forever. and that was also I think a lot of the problem was that they had to spend in the first episode I mean when I saw the first episode to be honest for second season I was really worried because I was like wow this is I thought it was cumbersome so, I, yeah, I thought it was and wrong. the reason why is that they had to re-explain everything because right, they yeah. knew the people mm-hmm. they wanted to catch the new audience right. and that just didn't cut it you know they Whereas really if you started to, if you had yeah. done the first season again. Yeah, they could have just seamlessly yeah. picked yeah. it up. Yeah. Yeah. But networks in general aren't doing that. Now that they do sort of these summer shows, yeah. nobody's really doing reruns anymore. Right, yeah. Well, there also there's no money in it anymore. Yeah. And that was the whole reason that we didn't used to have DVDs is they yeah. would wait for the money for syndication, and then after the show got into syndication, then they could release the DVDs. So it's kind of the, the lashback, yeah. as it were, of getting DVDs right away. Is now there's no money for the syndication yeah. rights. Yeah. And, 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 and also... Um, Standalone shows like procedural do well in reruns, and, and and they found that with modern scripted uh, shows that are not procedurals, there is a lot of arc built yep. in. Yep. Yeah. And Especially they do nowadays. not do well in reruns because you can't pick it up yep. immediately. Right. And, and, and 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 you you as I said in the um, TV panel yesterday, you cannot blame the network on this one mm-hmm. because. They went out on a big limb, and when when uh, Fuller presented them the bill for the first episode, they could have easily said, "You're fired." <laughs> but they went ahead and they publicized it, and they did as much as I think as much as they could do, and 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 audience just didn't back them up the second season. No. Well, I think the thing is that the, no one foresaw the degree that yeah. all the shows that weren't renewed after the strike, it was a completely unique event in TV history, yeah. no one foresaw the degree to which the shows that weren't picked up would suffer, the, uh, audience-wise. If they knew now what they no, if, no. if they knew then what they know now, <laughs> they would have done it differently. Yeah. And then maybe the, the not, damage done was irreparable. Not necessarily, uh, because as I said, um, procedurals do fine, and they probably no. would have said, but we just ran these, we're not going to run them. Oh, not as reruns. Really they, would have, they would have picked it up for like three, they, they would have for two or three episodes. Would have what we were saying is they would have finished out at least a partial. So it's, they would have had, instead of just the 13 episodes, then the writer's strike. And there was enough was time nine. to make about, uh, yeah. oh, nine, yeah. excuse me. Yeah. There'd be enough time to make another, say, two three. to three and more some episodes. Shows just that. so people some knew that. There, were, there, were, there was a handful of shows. Lots of shows did that. There were a number of shows on networks that... Most shows did. Most shows were. It was, the problem was, it seemed like it was the big ones that weren't. Heroes wasn't. Heroes wasn't, yeah. 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 Pushing Dates only in genre, Trump wasn't. No, well, only in but, genre, though. On uh, TV at large, most shows Right, a came lot. Back. Most or of the shows did come back. back. House, House came, came back. back very strong. Um, I think Grey's Anatomy came yeah. back. The yeah. ones that were really popular came back, and they have no problem this year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what they, we were talking they about. Didn't yeah. lose, they yeah. didn't lose the So, version. we have five minutes. Do we? Have, can we possibly, in five minutes, A, speculate on whether we're the... A sadly abandoned Oscar Verbinius storyline was going, and B, speculate upon where the show was going in the last three episodes. For instance, does, does uh, Ned's father have the same power? Do the yes. twins have the, this the is, twins this is, have the power but this share is what, it This is what was going to happen. And, 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 yeah, and, and, yes. I, I'm ripping this off from something I read on sfscope.com, okay. I think. I think is where I found it. But yeah. Ned's father has the power and what's going to happen is that Ned is going to try to figure out if there's a way to convince his father that if Ned kills Chuck, you know, just touches right. Chuck, he dies, Ned's father right. could bring Chuck back to life and then Ned could okay. touch Chuck. But then what was going to happen is they were going to do that and then Ned was going to suddenly realize, well, wait a minute, maybe that's not going to work. And if I were to touch you, you know, and maybe I wouldn't know what was going to happen, so they've gone through this whole thing and they'd be going through the existential okay. arcs together. Okay. In other words, he's not certain. Well, they could test, they could find any animal and test it. And this Ned is why Ned's father left, is yeah. that Ned's father discussed, and who knows, maybe, maybe Ned, Ned's father's yeah. going to tell him the reason I left is that at some point 
you died and I brought you back to life and you don't remember that and I have to stay with you. Oh, that's a good move. That's my own idea. I just came up with that. Ooh, that did you just get that right now? That's really good. When you rescued him, he had gloves on his hands? He did. He did. Ooh, that's I, I, it did. <laughs> I was just going to say it was all Tommy Westfall's dream. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Oh. That actually would make an incredible amount of sense. Yeah. What? What? Oh, Sarah. No, no, no. Hmm. Okay. Aaron Connor, uh, um, I, have a, I, have, I have a speculation, yeah. which is I haven't read anywhere. Right. But I, I really do think that the whole thing with the watches is going to turn out to be somehow that is how Ned got the power. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's the watch is not connected to the power. The watch thing yeah. is going to turn out to be some kind of like Pharaoh's curse or something that has passed on to Ned, which is why the father left to try and, I don't know, try and... It's a chameleon arch. Oh, <laughs> He's really Doctor Who? Right, exactly. <laughs> he can regenerate. I, I do think that the watches are important to mm -hmm. the... There's no question that the... that the You can't... The show would not be good if 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 the father's disappearance and the, all this with the watches weren't connected to the power, that wouldn't make any sense. Right, and, it's, and it's, it's clear it's also powerful because, I mean, no, no, the fact that she, you know, they could have kept it simple and she could have just gone in and taken Charles's, you know, yeah. Chuck's watch back. But the fact that she took Chuck's and Dwight's and the yeah. fact that they were there together in a case designed for three yeah. makes it very clear that the watches are going yeah. to be playing a very important yeah. part. Any, uh, any other speculations? That if that is true, mm -hmm. that the person who had the three watches would then gain the power. But Ned never had the three watches. No, no. It's not we don't know that. No, ultimate power. No, <laughs> the ultimate power. He makes it permanent, you know? So yeah. Where if he has the watches, they, they don't die. Yeah. We, we need yeah. to all go to Brian Fuller's house in a body and tell him, fine, the can show is canceled. What was your point? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, I, I think I've got it. Three watches rule them all. Oh. <laughs> um. I wonder whether whether um, I do wonder about the Pee Wee Rube, um, not Pee Wee, not the Paul Rubin Paul story Rube. arc. Yeah, there's which, a couple of arcs that they yeah. dropped. Like, yeah. I really I'm sorry that mm -hmm. they dropped the the arc of the guy with the, uh, the herbals. Yep. That came back. Oh, right, yeah, he was clearly going to be a love interest for It seemed like yeah. he was going to show That's another the rest of the first season. And I was like, the 13th right. episode. And, and, and Oscar Vivenius, the whole issue That's of who was going to be the other person who knew. Yeah. Right. yeah. You know, and and, and whether, not, whether or not that, that was going to be tied Oscar up romantically. Oscar will be in one of the final episodes, I'm pretty sure. Oh, I would love to see him oh, come back. He, yeah. he said that. Yeah. A lot of Why does it have to be a big secret? And why can't they tell all of that he can do this? That's yeah, a good point. Yeah, well, know. they don't trust Olive, and for good reason. Well, so Olive would tell left. everybody in the world, and he'd become, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he'd become a freak. Think, 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 think about, what, remember what, what Chuck's father said to him <coughs> was when he's trying to get Chuck's father to stay secret, he says, it's not me they're going to come after. It's yep. not the guy who's dead who came back to life. Mm -hmm. It's the guy who can bring the dead back to life. Yeah, yeah. Ned would yeah, be that's what he says to Ned has talked about ending up in a zoo or whatever. It's something in a dream. It always starts with me showing what people I can do, and it ends with people removing internal organs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, he's afraid they're going to stick him in a lab and cut him up and his life will be destroyed. Yeah. And, and that's think, a perfectly and, good fear. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And you know, for all of, and that brings up a very important point, the fact that for all that this is in many ways a fluffy light show mm -hmm. that we it has are watching, dark it's underpinning. got this underbelly. It's all about death. Yeah, it's, it's all, all about, about dark death. Underpinning. It's all about hiding the fact that he can bring people back to death be, uh, from, de yeah. uh, from death because he's afraid that they're going to turn him into a lab rat. Yeah. And yeah. you know, that L is Loss and loneliness and not being yeah. able to speak to people. I mean, we keep, why does it have to be a secret? Because the whole show is about secrets. The whole show is about the things that you don't tell people, the pieces of you that you don't show people, what happens when you choose to share them, yeah. what happens when they get out in the world and they take on a life of their own, they leave you a spoon and they drive away with your car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not a show about paranoia. But it, but it is a show, the world of the show is one in which there are consequences and things go off on their own directions, things take on a life of their own, and it is very much a show about, in many, I mean, if you, if you want to go horrendously metaphorical with the plastic wrap, how dangerous it is to get close to people, how dangerous it is to touch people, to let them into you, you know, I mean, you have to, you, you, the entire show is full of people keeping up barriers and boundaries in one way or another, and it is to the show's credit that you don't watch Pusting Daisies and, oh my god, human connection is impossible, I'm going to die. But, it, but, it, but the that's, that, but that's incredible. That's built into this show symbolically. It's built into the show literally, and it doesn't ever hit you over the head with it. But it is all woven in there. The, yeah. the aunts who don't leave their home. Yes. Yeah. You know. yes. 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 You don't go outside. You don't cross thresholds. You don't invite mm. people in. Yeah, and, and here, I thought the entire show was about pie. <laughs> that's the other thing. You watch the show, it makes you want to bake. Well, yeah. Yes. Or, or eat. Uh, Hold it. I I had to replace I had to replace my oven. 
<laughs> uh, this is true. Did you get Ned to touch it? No. Yeah. So, the one, whole, one, yeah. one of the best comments that I ever saw on when the cancellation of Pushing Daisies was announced was someone saying, couldn't we just get Ned to touch Pushing Daisies, then Dancing with the Stars would die? <laughs> And on that note, we thank you all for being on the podcast.